This is the Compass Podcast, where we try to disrupt your every day with divine moments. It's summertime in the United Methodist Church. It does not mean it's vacation time. Instead, it means it's annual conference time. And that means that we're out and about making plans for future church. And it also means the summer schedule is a bit tight. So I'm asking the indulgence of your patience on a new episode. And I'm offering this look back at one of our first episodes. This is a conversation with Kate Bowler, who at the time was a well-regarded but not so well-known college professor and author. She was on the verge of releasing a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, which then blew up. You can probably understand why. The book came out of Kate's cancer diagnosis. At the time, it was a stage four diagnosis, which is a pretty bleak one. So the book details her wrestling with the idea that God is behind this diagnosis. And it's somewhat ironic because as an academic, Dr. Bowler researched the prosperity gospel, which is the idea that faith makes good things happen. It's an internal conflict as old as belief itself. So this episode is timeless and we're going to revisit it with the good news that Dr. Bowler is still with us and thriving. Now, six years after her diagnosis, she's written a couple bestsellers now, including Everything Happens for a Reason, and she hosts the Everything Happens podcast. She's still teaching, too. So let's kick up back to 2018 and talk with Dr. Kate Bowler. Kate Bowler is with us. She's a mom, a wife. She's a professor of religious history at Duke University. She's the author of Blessed, which is a history of America's prosperity gospel. That's this this belief that if you have enough faith, then health and wealth and happiness are going to follow along in line. She's also a Canadian. She brags about that quite regularly. So I feel like, Kate, that's fair to say that's a part do, of, yeah. of your identity. Also, back in 2013, you uh, you taught a an upstart young pastor in training named Ryan, uh, as memorable as I'm sure that was. Um, uh, anything noteworthy happy since happened since then? Oh, for me? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Whoa. Uh, well, yes. Uh, my life is a lifetime movie, um, but uh, about a plucky upstart young professor who <laughs> uh, who started living her research. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I am an expert in the prosperity gospel, and when you're an expert at like 35, it means that you started too young. Like <laughs> it was, it got too weird too fast. So when I was maybe 23, I started already getting excited about this message of health and wealth and what it meant. And so, yeah, I studied that for about 10 years and wrote that history called Blessed. And then in the last two years, I got really, really sick and had to kind of grapple with the implications of what it means to be facing death in a culture that says that everything happens for a reason. Hmm. So, Kate, what was that what was that first remembrance, that first time you felt like you encountered that prosperity gospel, that, that thought process? Where were you? Was it in a room? Was it on TV? Was it on the radio? And then, and then also, I'd love to know, like, where were you in life at that moment Yeah, that, that well, connected I, with you? I was um, on our only freeway in Winnipeg, this super, super crappy. <laughs> I honestly, I love my hometown so much, and it has the worst roads. So we only have one road that goes fast, and it's the perimeter goes around the whole thing. And they put up a stoplight, and I almost <laughs> lost my mind. And I was like, guys, give this to me. And so I was sitting at the stoplight, and I was watching all these people file out of what I assumed was a warehouse. Mm. And then I looked over and realized... Um, oh no, this is a church. And and I thought, my first thought was, no, uh, we don't make churches that look like warehouses. We are, we are Canadians. <laughs> this is not us. There's no um, steeple on it? Is that what you're saying? Uh, just it has that sort of lovely industrial chic. And you know how like in the inside of mega churches, it all looks like it's the set of the musical Rent? You know, <laughs> oh, it, that's good. It's scaffolding and um, just uh, a lot of song, a lot of lingering song. <laughs> um, and so I heard that there's this huge church on the outside of town. And so I asked around about it and heard that there was a really slick pastor who celebrated holidays like Pastor's Appreciation Day and that he had gotten the gift of a motorcycle and that he'd ridden it around on stage. And I almost lost my mind because I thought, one, 
this can't be us. This is for Americans. <laughs> Two, how is it that so many of my Mennonite friends are going there? Mm-hmm. Mennonites who are historically committed to pacifism and simplicity and ruining everything with jello. And uh, and I thought, like, this, this is not the kind of simple faith that I was raised in and that I've come to know. So it sort of started started with that more car accident feeling you get when you notice something new and you think, Ugh. Mm. Uh, and then gradually it became uh, an intellectual interest. And then something I felt, I mean, pretty much deep empathy, almost defensiveness towards for its, um, for its ability to keep its finger on the pulse of something I thought most people were too quick to ignore. So were you before that time frame, childhood, uh, churched, unchurched? Yeah, very Jesus-y. Um, okay. my, parents, my parents both became Christians a little bit later in life, which meant that I skipped a lot of the um, full-on indoctrination of an evangelical youth. Mm-hmm. I was probably 16 before I realized there was a man out there somewhere named James Dobson, and he probably didn't want me to be a pastor, yeah. even though I didn't imagine being a pastor. I just knew he didn't want me to be. And uh, <laughs> and. So it was a kind of later, a later uh, inculcation into evangelicalism, but it was mostly Mennonite churches, gotcha. um, which were just lovely, cheese-eating pacifists. <laughs> so it, now as time has worn on, you have written another book, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I- I've Loved. Um, where did that come from? Why'd you write this book? When I got sick, I... I was sort of horrified to realize that there were aspects of the prosperity gospel, something I thought I had studied only intellectually, that that I started worrying that maybe I believed all along. So, like, for instance, when you get that sick, so I, I go from just being a regular person with no cancer in my family to suddenly getting a stage four cancer diagnosis mm-hmm. at 35. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, it was just like a bomb. It like, it felt like it was, it was just utter devastation. And in the midst of that, I had, I mean, I think all the natural feelings of shock and, you know, fear and horror. And, but then I just started wondering, like, what did I really hope for? Like, what did I really expect? Mm. And did I really feel, think that maybe this was all going to work out? Uh, And were these, were these theological beliefs? Like, were these, you know, like, you're trying to figure out why you're so angry at God. And then you have to wonder, like, did I really think that you promised me this all along? So I wrote the book sort of as a kind of painful, hopeful, theological excavation project where I just tried to dig into the hardest things about who I am. Like, did I, did I think that I was special? Did I think that I was the exception to the rule that bad things just happen to people? Mm -hmm. And it's, it was, um, it gave me, I think, renewed compassion for the people that I've studied for so long who want, I think, really average things from God. Like, I think we imagine the health and wealth gospel as like, everybody wants a Mercedes. But like, I think people really mostly want the things that keep our lives together. They want, you know, kids that don't despise them and clothes that look okay on them and enough money in the bank to feel comfortable. And just that feeling like your life is moving forward, Mm -hmm. you know? And then when you have to imagine that your life is it going anywhere? Like, because it might end. It is, it is bracing. <laughs> Let me show you. And it really, it really caused me to wonder and to question and just to try to get real about what Christian hope really looks like. Hmm. I think we probably need to un- unpack a, a little bit what your diagnosis is that uh, at the age of 35, you were diagnosed with stage four cancer and well, what does that look like for you now? Well, it's been two years of treatment, which is not fun. It mostly just means that your life is usually in the hospital, and it doesn't seem weird when people are wearing face masks when they're talking to you. And you're really good at small talk while people are taking out needles that are seem like they're for horses, but they're for people. And you sort of develop this pattern of life around 
the normal world that everybody else lives in and then hospital world. So I started hospital world about almost not quite two and a half years ago, maybe like a little over two years ago. Yeah. And so it's a liturgy of scans and blood work and, um, and standing in line for a very expensive copay. Hmm. So that, that takes up most of my life. <laughs> so I want to go back to that kind of core belief of you need to have faith. And the way that you show you have faith is, is through your giving, your tithing, right? And, yeah. and, and it goes deeper than that, obviously. Um, and so somebody that was, for you, that was in that world to some degree, and it, that you talked about, you studied it, and now on this side of it, where do you see faith really being played out? And how does it really be played out? And, and versus mm-hmm. how it's been abused? Well, I think... Um... I think the prosperity gospel is confused because it's gotten, it's, it's, it's blurred the distinction between hope and certainty. Mm. It is at its heart, a theodicy, right? An explanation for the problem of evil in the world. Mm. And it looks at the have nots and it says like, God has provided a solution through giving, through prayer, through intentional, um, spiritual hustle. Like you really can have what God has promised you. And the beauty in that is that it expects God to show up in the details of your life. Mm -hmm. I I found that to be really inspirational. When I would go to church on Sunday with them, um, they were really expecting God to do something that week. I thought that was a kind of lovely anticipation that is often missing in other churches. But the saddest part, of course, is that immediately then tragedy becomes a burden on those who can't get it together. And it forgets, it's like it forgets what it's like to stand on the side of the losers like me, like the downtrodden. And I mean, that's partly why I'm really excited my book is coming out at Lent, because Lent is the time when the church is supposed to be on my side, Mm. not the side of the winners, not the side of like the Easter faith and the he is risen indeed. It's the marching toward death facing down the darkness, standing on this side of the abyss and saying like, what could ever paper over the difference? Mm. I think we have to practice being Lenten people. And the problem I think fundamentally is that the prosperity gospel is, is out of practice. Mm. Your book, it it expresses a kind of a dissatisfaction with extremes. Like when you're (laughs) diagnosed and, and you kind of make this, this, announcement to the public um yeah. you get a lot of people sharing a lot of different things with you. And <laughs> yeah on, on one hand there there are like the atheists who write to you to say you should probably just give up the search for religious meeting yeah. and, and then on the other hand and this is not a, a bandwagon that you're really to, willing to jump on either there are people who yeah. are writing that are saying there's a plan for this right this is yeah. this is god's will this happened for a reason every reformed dude out there is <laughs> convinced there's a lesson I haven't learned. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And it's still coming. Um, so <laughs> your experience isn't really, it, it's not really driven by divine design, but it's not devoid of like sure. divine presence either. So no, I think that's right. Like, I mean, cause here's, here was the great surprise for me about being sick is that, and I really mean this as a legitimate surprise but God was there anyway. And like, it gets me so emotional just like saying that to you right now. Cause it's like, it was, you know, I'm a pretty cerebral person and I like categories and now I'm experiencing a world that's sort of despair beyond categories. And I was genuinely surprised that in the worst of my hospital moments, I could actually feel God's presence. And like, let me tell you how grateful I am. <laughs> grateful that I don't have to to invent God. Mm. I didn't have to, and I didn't have to pray a special prayer and I didn't have to have a special faith because I was unconscious most of the time. (laughs) I mean, God is, was just there. And like that I think is, is the deep hope of grace that, that like that God will make up the difference just because of who God is. And I love that that takes me to a place beyond formulas and beyond, because I didn't deserve it, you know, I didn't do anything to get it. And there's really no like special formula for getting it back either. You know what I mean? Like when you're walking or like you're just having a moment and you can sort of 
actually suddenly realize that God is there. And then there's the rest of the day where it just feels annoying and the person beside you is coughing and like, you know, you hate your neighbor. And, you know, then there's just the rest of ordinary time. And so the great surprise is learning to live without being able to conjure up all the feelings and the proof and just to live with the hope and that that in the worst of it, there is something beyond ourselves that's like determined to pursue us. What were some of the specific moments that made you aware that God was there? A lot of it was just people like, <laughs> this is so stupid, but when I first came to Duke, I was really, <laughs> this is, this is going to sound really ungrateful. I really bummed out that I had gotten my dream job so early and that I'd have to live here for the rest of my life and probably die in my office. It's so lame, but like I achieved my dreams. I was so happy. Thank you, Duke. Got my job. And then I had all these lingering fears about dying in my office someday, like lonely and sad. Um, and, uh, and I read, I was a part of this book group and uh, it was about this other guy, uh, Reynolds Price, who'd gotten sick. Uh, Duke, and that he, when he was rushed to the hospital, the guy who he shared a printer with, like, took him to the hospital. And I remember, like, ruining this poor book group of mostly strangers being like, how depressing! <laughs> like, you're stuck with the people you share a printer with. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, I, I get sick, and my family can't be here in time. Like, nobody can get here in time, because it's such an emergency. And guess who's there at the hospital? Well... It's everyone I share a printer with and like every beautiful person I was just in a faculty meeting with or down the hall is showing up to anoint my head with oil or like get me socks or, you know, make sure the temperature of the room is great. Like it was the most intense feeling of like feeling ministered to with the hands and feet and face of Jesus, it was so, I was so blown away by how ungrateful I had been by the possibility of this and then just how grateful I was when it came true. So in those, in those moments for those that are listening and, and, um, and as part of my story as well, walking away from the faith and coming back to it, uh, what do you say to the person that just goes, man, you were just surrounded by good people. God really wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Like you just, you had caring people around you that loved you. And, and was there for you in that moment. Um, how, do you, how do you differentiate that in that moment um, to know that there's more than just um, yeah, good, good people feeling. there? Yeah, the sort of day-to-day -day stuff was the good people, but the divine presence stuff was something more. And it was something actually I was so uncomfortable talking about that I just sort of kept it to myself. Because <laughs> I didn't... I Because you get to the part where it's very hard to explain or rationalize. Yeah. Um, mostly because um, I think maybe as growing up in evangelicalism, you feel like everything that's true, you should be able to put in a pamphlet. Mm. <laughs> the presence of God to me feels like overwhelming love. Mm. And sometimes it comes through people, but so much of it was just lying by myself, listening to the beep of hospital machines pretty sure because they told me that I was going to die that year and not feeling angry because all I could feel was love. Yeah. I think for when I was in that part of my journey and then even, you know, today having friends that, that would, would put themselves in a classification of atheism or agnostic, you know, um, that whole idea of God's presence and knowing God's there, uh, like, for those people that do have faith, it kind of freaks us out too. Oh, I mean, honestly, you know? <laughs> I think, I think really in retrospect, I don't think I'd really felt it before. Yeah. I mean, like, I think I'd had worship experiences I'd enjoyed. I felt, I, I sort of experienced the truth of, uh, what I see as the gospel. You know, I was like very convinced, mm -hmm, but that's, mm -hmm. not, but like, was I shocked by the presence of God? No, <laughs> I mean, probably not. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not until then. Yeah. And like, it was to the point where I went around asking all my theologian friends, like, is this normal? Mm -hmm. Will this stay? Like I had a lot of questions because I was, I was genuinely surprised. Yeah. But luckily I work with mostly theologians. So they, 
like took the book off the shelf and we're like, look, Lena said it best, <laughs> which honestly was really helpful because you feel like um, you, you want to. I mean, it's like anybody when they like have a weird thing on their toe, they're like, is this normal? And then they Google it. That's sort of my theological experience where I want always going, is this normal? And then everyone Duke, kind of your Duke colleagues are your your are your spiritual WebMD. Yeah, they, <laughs> I, I really, that is exactly right. In the midst of finding God in these moments, um, and, and being a person who's, well, academic, and you have a, a broad understanding of what religion is, um, yeah. why hold to a, a Christian world view? Like, like, what is it about Christianity that, that paints a, a different light uh, or a different color onto this? In my story everything comes apart and I find in the story of Jesus, a guy who gets nailed to the cross and then he just hangs there. Like his humiliation, his, the inability for it to be a shiny story Hmm. is so Hmm. moving to me because I mean, there's, I just imagine like, there's all these books that actually I have in this bookshelf beside me called like Jesus CEO, right? As if like this one that we imagine, if we imagine Jesus as the like pastorpreneur, like he knew how to have an efficient day. He knew how to maximize his time. (laughs) That's right. All (laughs) kinds of, uh, you know, inspirational, tweetable things to share. And, uh, and like, I picture the person I was trying to become and then someone who didn't waste a minute and was always moving forward. And then I look at the example of Jesus and like, it was that that really stayed with me when I was facing the exhaustion of a life that wasn't going to come together. Mm -hmm. And I find in the Lenten church, all kinds of beauty that in the cracks, the presence of God fills it and let something grow. And the sheer impossibility of that, I think, will always allow me to see Jesus as like the full expression of hope in the crushing darkness. Yeah, I think that's a great line, seeing Jesus in the crushing darkness. Because sometimes that crushing darkness is, is your situation, right? It's a, it's a, it's a diagnosis. Um, it's an uncertainty of, of what's next and when is the next happening. Yeah. And then... It's also that moment of going to a job every day and that same person making that same comment that's eating you away and you just can't get past it. And so it comes in in all different forms for all different people. Um, But within that context of that darkness, there is a hope and there is a light. And for people of faith, it's even for us like we've been talking about, it, it, it can surprise us and shock us in the moments. But I love what you said. Yeah. One of the things that you took away from, from the prosperity church and faith is, is that they came in with some expectancy. Of, they of, did. Of, of seeing God move, of being active in our life. And that's the thing I think that most churches and most Christians across the theological spectrum probably lack, you know, is that expectancy that, that we serve a God and, and, and we, we're in love with a God who is active. I heard, I heard preach the other day, the sermon out of Acts 1, right, where Jesus, his last moments with his disciples right before they go, and, and he tells them all these things, and, and he says, I want you to go here and do this, and he, like, final instructions before he leaves, and, and, and he tells them to wait, right, for the Holy yeah. Spirit to come, and so it's that moment of him going, you have, you have my words, you have my directions, you don't have my spirit yet, so wait, and so I, I've heard that sermon preached, I'm a pastor's kid, right, so I've heard that yeah. all the time. And so I was hearing it preached, and I was like, yes, this is a good sermon. This is good stuff. And then the guy flipped it, and he said, if you go back, and I had not done this yet, he goes, if you go back to the original language, the word wait, we've kind of translated it wrong. It actually means to expect. There's an expectancy there, Mm -hmm. to wait with expectancy. It's such a beautiful thing for us, and that is throughout your book and throughout your story of going like, "I'm, I'm waiting on God because I know God is there, and I will see him in that crushing darkness. Yeah, I think it's so hard to wait, like, because, I mean, we're, we're incomplete, and everything comes apart all the time. 
Yeah. Right. So like you reconcile with someone and then that friendship comes undone. Mm-hmm. You have hopes for your kid and then there's a setback at school. Like there's a million ways where we're trying to put a bow on things. I think just because we're always seeking endings so much, I think of having to live the Christian life is, is to learn. I think you're right to wait with expectancy and just know though in the midst of it, you are inherently not a problem to be solved yes. just because you're in pain, yeah. you know? Yep. I heard. We, we're in pain because we are, the kingdom of God is not yet here, period. Yes. It's good. And like, it, there will be enough. Like, that's the prosperity gospel we can believe in. God will give us enough. But what enough means will not be very easy to see with the naked eye. Mm. I love the little since I'm a millennial, I love the little tweetable statement that says you're not a project, but you're in process Mm -hmm. and uh, something I've held on to for a while. Oh no. Everyone wants you to be a project though. They want lists. Uh, Yes. Listicles. Yeah. No. If one more person tries to fix me, I will do something that requires them to be (laughs) needing a little assistance sometime soon. I'm getting close to just threats and, (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to let you vent for a moment then. So the appendices of your book, which, by the way, is is a fantastic book. And I'm going to realistically recommend this for everybody that's listening. Um, no matter what stage mm-hmm. of life that you're in, everything happens for a reason is is a wonderful read. Um, and well, full of, of a lot of profundity or profound <laughs> thoughts and statements. Um, for me, I found that the appendices uh, like really oh, profound. Yeah, I wish that they taught seminary <laughs> classes just on, on that kind of stuff. And in, in fact, if you want to like make a poster, people would, sure, sure, would sure. probably purchase that. So mm-hmm. that when we're having those moments, uh, we know not to say like, well, you know, at least you have blank or oh yeah, or, yeah yeah there's a lot of so this is this is the part that moves me to threats lately is um <laughs> okay it's like two things one is i wrote two popular pieces like and the first one the point of the piece was um please don't pour certainty on my pain hmm. period that was it like hey the world is hard please don't try to force me to say that everything's happening for a reason yeah and then what did thousands of people do? <laughs> he wrote me letters to tell me why everything happens for a reason. <laughs> and I was like, guys, you're killing me here. And then the second popular piece was like, hey, try not to minimize other people's situations. And just like don't treat them like problems to be solved. And then, of course, I immediately get email. It's like, look. <laughs> I looked it up, and you're not in the hospital right now. <laughs> so is it really that bad? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's so many ways I think people forget that their presence really matters to someone like me. Like, there's a thousand things to do that don't require them to have perfect things to say. Like, I... I have found that I'm usually not looking for reasons or explanations or, or the right words. I'm just looking for someone to show up and to let me be a human, whatever that means that day. So I love um, presence. I am not above receiving gifts of all kinds. And it's so much better if they're not cancer thematically appropriate. Like, <laughs> Just like I, I, I just I like stupid erasers or like a potted plant. Like people just love it when you remember them, and they love it when you find a way to compliment them without seeming like um, they're talking about you in the past tense. Mm-hmm. And they just want to know that you recognize them where they are, but you're not asking something. Mm-hmm. So all you can just say is like, "Man, I'm so sorry. It's been such a tough year." And then pivot or describe that you want to be there. Like my, my friend says, like, when in doubt, describe. You say, you know, I'm, I'm so glad to see you and I've been worried about being a bad friend and I don't want to say the wrong thing. I just want you to know that I love you. Done. Yeah. Like chasm overcome. <laughs> you have solved the world. So there's, there's so many ways to be present, I think, without being trite and, um, and trying to offer someone an explanation for what's happening to them. 
In the book, there, there's a line that I, I can't quite get over. Uh, I think it's because it speaks to me uh, so deeply. It, it's this line that where you said, I, I failed to love what was present and, and decided to love what was possible instead. And, mm. and now I must learn to live in ordinary time, but I don't know how. And you're speaking to uh, this idea that you'd always kind of been in love with things that were going to happen in the future, uh, mm-hmm. you know, working towards your, your career and, and, and building a family. And, and now you're learning to, well, to be present in, in the day. What have you figured out now about living in ordinary time? (laughs) I am the worst. I think that book is like, I love, (laughs) I just noticed rereading parts. I'm like, I have learned nothing, (laughs) but I do try to do this one thing where I, I try to notice like a peak moment in the day because like, because it could happen at any time. Like this morning, uh, my kid crawled into bed beside me and he passes me a stuffed animal that he brought me from downstairs. And then there was just such like a sweet little snuggle. And I thought like, what if this is the best part of my day? Like just stay there, you know? And so yeah. I try to learn to stretch out the time a little more and not to always be imagining that like the day is something I'm supposed to conquer, but something that will come to me that I need to be much more aware of the, of the moments I'm living in and not just the time passing. In those moments that you're looking at, what are some moments that you look back and you wish you could have stretched out a little longer? I don't know. Do you, do you notice that some people's brains work backwards? Like they're able to isolate regrets. Do you know what I mean? And some Some of us are just backwards thinkers. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, well, I think I only think forwards. Mm. So my, like, I, I find I'm able to like forgive other people very quickly, for instance, because I don't think backwards very much. Oh, right. That's um, a great quality. Yeah. Well, I, I did feel like, I think I was just wired that way. Most of my sins are forward thinking sins. <laughs> Ones <laughs> in which I, in which I like gobble up time because I'm living in a future that does not yet exist. Hmm. You've talked about, um, the awareness of Lent, and uh, we're moving into this season of Lent. Uh, yeah. What does, what does Dr. Kate plan on giving up for Lent? Oh, man. Ooh, ah, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, as someone who went to Catholic school, the answer is always, of course, chocolate. Chocolate, yeah. Or, the or, um, yeah, or <laughs> the great, exactly. We should do, definitely do a thing about the great evils of Lent. But, like, cho- <laughs> chocolate mild gossip about a shared enemy. Um <laughs> I, well, cause last year I gave up like video games that were taking up, that were just like numbing me out, uh, which is so dumb, but I needed to like actually learn to sit with discomfort. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> wait, hold on now. Hold on. We got it. We had a pause battling. on this. We yeah. had a pause. What's your video games? <laughs> well, that's the question. I, I love, um, Oh, I love turn-based strategy games, you know, like Civilization and oh, those. Yeah. Yes, got it. they're so great. I mean, I, I yeah. believe that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, it's so fun. I couldn't play stuff like Age of Empires because when like things in which like there's no separation of time, and all of a sudden you'd be like do 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 do, and like people are attacking you. Right, it's continuous <laughs> movement. <laughs> exactly. So that's I'm trying to. I don't know. I think for Lent, I I don't know what it is, but it would have to have the certain these certain qualities. One, it would have to learn, teach me how to be a little bit more present. It would have to not be something that like diminishes the quality of day. Do you know what I mean? So that I don't actually enjoy other people. Mm. I feel like that's always people's um like self flagellation time. Where they're like, this is the worst. <laughs> and I'm like, no, my life is already the worst. I need my small comforts. Mm. Um, and third, I think maybe it would be something that allows me to think more about service. Cause I think sometimes when you're in the middle of the tragedy, you forget, it can be really hard to remember the pain of others consistently. Mm. So I don't know, something that forces me out of my own head and into somebody else's problems, whatever that is. I want to do that. <laughs> Sounds like Instagram's getting deleted. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you know what other people are doing then, Pierce? If that's, you're not, <laughs> you have to be present with them. That's right. You have to be present. <laughs> oh. Well, you are undertaking something new. You're going to start a podcast of your own. What can we look forward yeah. to in that? 
Ooh, well, um, I've got this podcast called Everything Happens, yeah. and then for a reason is scratched out, because I wanted to talk to other people who have, I think, had to relearn their life after the worst thing happened. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd like to thicken up the language around um, being grateful even after tragedies of all kinds, without having to say trite things like that God is redeeming the situation. Hmm. But like, we really can learn things in the dark. So what are they? So I'm interviewing um, uh, people like Nadia Bowles-Weber about what she learned about being a pastor through alcoholism. Hmm. Um, hmm. Talking to my friend Ray Barfield, who had to learn how to be a pediatric oncologist who lets little kids break his heart um talking to um let's see uh lucy kalanithi who's uh the wife of the man who wrote when breath becomes air um about uh his own uh fears of his passing and what she learned about loving no matter what so yeah i'm talking to some really brave people and i'm i'm really hoping to learn some things on that really quick before we before we close I was reading this book yesterday or last few days on Gen Z so this is this generation 1999 and above they're very different than millennials a lot of things but one of the staggering statistics from this Barna group study came out that said um, kind of asked what was the what did they want to do by the time they were 30 right so what are your priorities by the time you're 30 and only I think it was two out of ten maybe three out of ten said they want to know who they really are Huh. Which which kind of broke. I mean, not kind of. It, it broke my heart reading that. Um, huh. That it was that that that's being put off so far by this next generation. And so one of the things I just heard you talk about in that was you know so often we wait till the moment of despair or we wait till the sure. moment of tragedy to find out who we are. Yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah. And so in that. For that person that's listening, you know, they're in high school right now. They're getting ready to head to college, or maybe it, it could be somebody else. What's an encouraging word that you can give them for they don't have to wait for the tragedy to find out who they are? Well, yeah. And like, I think I always thought that my job at that stage was always to just get somewhere else. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I look at my like 17 year old self and I think, oh my gosh, she was so afraid mm -hmm. that like she was not going to be able to piece things together and like get into that school and f get into that program and get those grades and like always thinking forward. Yeah. And I'm grateful for all the habits and whatever it takes to get things done. But like the problem is you can learn so much of yourself if you're not trying to skip to the end. I mean, the great mystery of anybody, right, is that they're a discovery and they're not usually the stories that other people have told them. And like we all have to like dig in and figure out who that person is. And it's 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 we are usually a surprise to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'm grateful that when I dig, I d when like when I did take a minute, that I had more than I thought I had. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, that like what I had already was enough. Yeah. And maybe I could be a little less panicked about the future if I could just linger a little more in the present. So, Kate, thank you so much for joining us on, on this episode. Uh, the book is available February 7th. Everything happens for a reason and other lies I've loved. And um, when does the, the podcast formally launch? Oh, yeah. The first three episodes are the day of book release. So awesome. All right. Yeah, you thanks so much for having me. This was so fun. Thanks for taking this journey back into time with us. You can learn more about Compass and check out our other episodes at umc.org slash compass. If you were into this episode, you should definitely follow it up with a listen to our episode about UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence because it wrestles with questions of life and meaning as well. So glad to have this time with you. My name is Ryan Dunn. Thanks to United Methodist Communications for resourcing this podcast. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.